M S W Media. So, Steve, in light of the Colorado Supreme Court's recent opinion, what are the odds that Trump's name isn't going to be on the ballot? It's complicated. I'm Asha Rangappa. I teach national security law at Yale University. I'm a former FBI special agent, and I'm a legal contributor for ABC News. And I am not Renato. I'm Steve Vladek. Uh, I am a law professor at the University of Texas School of Law. Uh, I'm also CNN Supreme Court analyst and author of the book, The Shadow Docket, about the Supreme Court and a weekly newsletter about the Supreme Court called One First. And we're here to help you understand topics that can't be boiled down into a soundbite or a tweet. So this has been a big week already for you. Steve, and I'm so excited that you're here because you're literally the perfect person uh, in light of the news dump that we've gotten. Um, the news dump being the recent Colorado Supreme Court ruling. And so I thought we could dive in and maybe go into a little bit of the substance of the Colorado Supreme Court's opinion and then what happens from here. Sure. I mean, so the the substance is actually, I think, relatively straightforward. Um, the Colorado Supreme Court held that uh, President Trump uh, does meet the criteria under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. He did engage in insurrection in his actions on and before January 6th. Um, he is the kind of officer to whom Section 3 applies. And he is therefore, in the Colorado Supreme Court's words, um, ineligible to be on the ballot for either primary or general elections uh, to the office of the president in the state of Colorado. Um, what I think a lot of folks missed in the immediate sort of uh, headlines about the ruling is that the ruling is frozen. Uh, the Colorado Supreme Court stayed its decision until at least January 4th, uh, which is, if my math is right, about uh, two weeks from when this is coming out, uh, a little under two weeks. Um, and that stay will continue if President Trump, between now and January 4th, asks the U.S. Supreme Court to review that decision, which he surely will, which means that even though the Colorado Supreme Court says Trump is disqualified, you know, Asha, chances are he's going to be on at least the primary ballot in Colorado because the, the deadline for that is January 6th or January 5th, I think. Um, and then the real question is, what happens after that? Okay, so we'll, let's get to that in a minute, because I definitely want to think about what, what happens after that. Um, in terms of the opinion itself, um, so I'm curious what you think of just the, the what happened before it even got here. So the district court had determined as a matter of fact that Trump engaged in an insurrection but that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment did not apply to the office of the president. Yep. And that was widely excoriated, I think, by legal scholars. And I'm just curious what you thought of that reasoning. Because it was that purposefully setting this up so that the factual question, which to me is in some ways really the crucial piece here, Right, the factual determination that he actually engaged in an insurrection yeah. would be kind of the the big finding that would be given great deference, and then on appeal, the court could, you know, um, is it was it passing the buck? Was it a well reasoned uh, but you know misguided position? That I, mean, what do you think about that and how it kind of was postured on the way up? So, you know, I, I don't know why uh, the, the trial judge in Colorado structured her ruling that way. I, I will say that I think there's at least one respect in which that particular analysis is attractive, um, where you have courts saying on the one hand, yes, Trump did engage in insurrection, but here's some technical obstacle that's keeping us from actually keeping him off the ballot. So condemning Trump without disqualifying Trump. I think there's actually some utility to that as a matter, Asha, if nothing else, than of like high politics, um, 
right? The, the problem is that legally the argument is really hard to swallow because it requires us to accept, as the Colorado Supreme Court pointed out, that the drafters of the 14th Amendment would not have understood Section 3 to prevent Jefferson Davis from running for president of the United States. Um, and it's just that just doesn't make sense, um, right? And so we have this problem where the sort of, yes, he committed insurrection, but no, he's not the kind of officer covered by Section 3, solves a political problem, but doesn't really withstand a lot of legal scrutiny. Um, and, you know, as the, the Colorado Supreme Court said on Wednesday or on Tuesday, um, you know, the, the much better reading here is that President Trump was exactly the kind of officer, um, if, if not the most important officer who owed the kind of duty to the Constitution that Section 3 is meant to, to, to connect to. So I guess I'll say I, I think there's some elegance to the he's not the right officer argument as a matter of sort of optics and symbolism and the role of the courts. The problem is that if you're just doing the pure law, you know, I, I think the Colorado Supreme Court's on the right side of that. Yeah, and they really went into the structure of the amendment, the intention of the framers of the amendment. They parsed the rest of the Constitution to yep. look at how the word office and officer is used elsewhere. And I'm wondering, you know, is this going to be persuasive substantively to the Supreme Court? who claim to be originalists. Because I have to be honest, I am now, I've just become a cynic. Like, I'm just like, okay, here we go. We're going to, you know, get some hanky-panky shenanigan opinion coming down that's going to engage in some kind of sophistry. But, but their analysis seemed to be exactly the kind of thing that your originalist textualist argument could hang their hat on, if they were being honest. The, there's a really profound irony in what's about to happen, which is that the the sort of the Supreme Court is now caught between a rock and a hard place. Um, and the rock is the Colorado Supreme Court and the hard place is the Supreme Court's own rejection over and over again of the idea that high politics has any place in Supreme Court decision making. Um, because, you know, 40 years ago, I mean, I, 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 I teach in my first year common law class, the Watergate tapes case, U.S. versus Nixon, um, where the Supreme Court rules eight to nothing that President Nixon had to comply with the Watergate special prosecutors subpoena Dukas Tecum um, for, you know, for grand jury uh, um, evidence. And Asha, I mean, as you know, what's remarkable about the actual opinion the court files in Nixon is that it's a bunch of nonsense. Um, right, that the the notion that the there is both a constitutionally grounded executive privilege and that it's overcome <laughs> by the prosecutor's need to have evidence in a criminal case, like both of those holdings don't really you know persuade. Um, and yet the court did it as a matter of political expediency um, in an opinion by Nixon's own handpicked Chief Justice Warren Burger with a unanimous court, with no concurrences, with no dissents, entirely because that court understood in that moment that what they actually said was so much less important than what they did, um, mm. right? And and that was, you know, 49 years ago, and that was how the Supreme Court used to approach cases like that. Now you have justices who say over and over again, you know, however persuasively, that they're committed to following the law wherever it leads them, uh, right? Let, let justice be done, though the heavens fall. Um, and, you know, if you really believe that, then I think the Colorado Supreme Court has the better of the legal analysis on both the question of whether President Trump engaged in insurrection and whether Section 3 applies to him in the first place. Um, if you believe that there is a place for high politics in how the Supreme Court interprets the Constitution, especially in high profile cases like this one, you know, that might be a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient one. And so this is, to me, such a real sticky wicket for the Supreme Court, because the law, I think, is in one place and the politics are, to me at least, not so obviously in the same place. And the court has been so adamant as it has turned so sharply to the right in the last six, seven, eight years 
that all it's doing is law. So just so I understand what you're su- you're suggesting, you're saying the law is that the Colorado Supreme Court got it right. Like at like in as a matter of law, if we were looking at you know nothing else uh, and the implications and policy whatever that Trump is under the Constitution as a matter of law disqualified from being president. But you think, but you're saying that you don't think you don't think the court can do there go there or should go there should so so you know i mean i this is this is i realize this is this is a weird argument for a constitutional law professor to make but these are weird times i mean i i you know i I tweeted this tuesday night and knew i was going to get in trouble for it and did but i think you can believe at the same time that president trump engaged in insurrection and that he ought to be disqualified from ever holding office again, and also believe, given the you know Republican Party's um, casual relationship with truth and facts and evidence, and um, widespread endorsement of January six related and election related conspiracy theories, that it's actually better for our politics if Trump loses, having been on the ballot in all fifty states than if he loses having been kept off the ballot in a handful of states by this, you know, maybe correct Asha, but novel um, application of a constitutional provision that very few people had heard about um, before 2021. And so, you know, I, I think what what this really is, and I mean, you you know this as well as anyone, is, you know, the, the dirty little secret is that law is not an absolute. Um, right, law is part of a is part of a mush that politics is also part of, and I think that the Supreme Court probably was hoping against hope that they didn't get dragged into this mess, um, and that maybe the Colorado Supreme Court, like the Minnesota Supreme Court, found a way to not keep Trump off the ballot. And to me, the real headline of what happened on Tuesday is now I think the Supreme Court has to step in against you know not not wanting to, and in a way in which there's almost no you know obvious win right for the Supreme Court. So counterpoint and then a question. Please. Counterpoint. This ultra conservative court which has been you know under so much scrut I think justified scrutiny for um engaging in you know basically outcome based um you know, approach to to the law um, in favor of uh, conservative interests could simply apply the law and vindicate itself as in some ways of as being not just the lackey for for the right. In other words, uh, you know, as long as we're in like a constitutional crisis. Um, maybe it's a chance for the Supreme Court to actually establish itself as impartial. So, I mean, let me say two things. First, um, I don't, even if the Supreme Court were to affirm the Colorado Supreme Court, I do not think that that would prove that everything that folks like you and I have criticized the Supreme Court for recently was wrong. Um, right. What one decision does not an impartial Supreme Court make. Um, it's a big decision though. Right. Um, so I think. He, what gives me pause is not that I think institutionally that would be a very profound thing for this Supreme Court to do, especially a court with three justices who were appointed by President Trump. What gives me pause is that I think if the Supreme Court did that, you know, there'd be a whole lot of people who would refuse to accept it. Um, and that's partly the Supreme Court's fault for having, you know, having been sort of in the stew, right, of public criticism so much in recent years. And it's partly because of the politics of our current moment. And so, you know, I, I don't I don't harbor any illusion that what I'm saying comes from any deep principle. I mean, I think the, the deep principle here is Trump should not be on the ballot this year. Um, but that principle has already suffered a, a series of setbacks. It suffered setbacks when, you know, he wasn't um, convicted by the Senate, right, in the second impeachment yeah. trial in January and February of 2021. It suffered a setback when Republican leaders 
did not come together to prevent him from being a leading candidate for you know the Republican nomination in 2024. And so I just, the, you know, this notion that we should expect the Supreme Court to save us um, is the one that I'm having a little trouble with, given the court we have and given the politics that we have, um, versus, yeah. right, um, thinking that the real way to, quote, save us um, is for Trump to lose in a way that is as, you know, immune to um, claims of manipulation, cheating, skullduggery, and what have you as possible. Not because the Colorado Supreme Court is wrong. Again, I think it's right. But because there are times when there are more important things than being right on the law. Yeah. Well, I would say, I, I take your point. I will say that the last time Trump was beaten fair and square in an election, it led to an insurrection. It did. So, and and, and uh, widespread claims yeah. that, you know, are still... So it's not, it's not like beating him fair and square, he's going to be like, okay, I guess you beat me. You know, is it going to be more? But, but, but it's not, it's, it's not, it's not him I'm worried about, right? It's, it's just how large a number of supporters he has, right? Who are willing to resort to violence. Um, if they believe that Trump is somehow deprived of his rightful chance to be reelected to the presidency. Yeah. So on that point, this was my, my question that I had after my counterpoint, even if, the Supreme Court were to affirm the Colorado Supreme Court, you're saying that that would not create a uniform disqualification. In other words, if they were to if they were to affirm the actual line of reasoning that the Colorado Supreme Court used, it seems to me that he's then just constitutionally disqualified in every state. So, yes, but you would need either states to, to react on their own or you would need someone to sue states that don't react that way. Right. So. So, you know, I suspect that in in a hypothetical universe where the Supreme Court says, yes, we believe Trump, you know, is disqualified by dint of Section three. I suspect there will be a bunch of states where the relevant officials with no prodding, with no poking, you know, on their own, remove Trump from the electoral process. And I think there will be states where they have to be sued. Um, I think I live in one of them, um, where where I think the, you know, the states are going to resist that until and unless a court orders them to do it. So that's going to be its own crazy, if that were to go. So, so let's talk about what are the other off ramps for the Supreme Court, assuming that they're not going to, like, in other words, what are some of the ways that they could punt or avoid some of these substantive questions, because there were some threshold questions that the Colorado Supreme Court addressed. Um, for example, whether states can make this own determination of who's who's qualified to be on the ballot, whether this is a political question, and we can talk about what that means. Um, and also, to me, the merits were, the underpinning of the merits in the Colorado Supreme Court case was based on this idea that Section 3 is self-executing. And so there's also the possibility that they could say, well, you know, it needs something more. He needs a conviction. He needs, you know, there, there has to be some kind of higher adjudication than just a, a civil, you know, trial of some kind. So what, what do you see as the, the ways that this could go? I mean, those are all off-ramps. Um, you know, and, and I think some of them are more plausible and more convincing than others. Um, you know, the, the sort of the easy case for enforcing Section 3 is Congress refusing to seat someone who's elected to the House or the Senate, but who in Congress's view, um, right, fails to meet the, you know, violate Section 3. Um, that, I think, is pretty powerful evidence, Asha, that Section 3 is self-executing. That, you know, that was sort of the most understood way to do it, that you Congress wouldn't have needed any other procedure just to refuse to seat a member. Um, you know, the last part of Section three that says Congress can remove the disability by a two thirds vote of both chambers strongly implies that the disability exists uh, without any affirmative action from Congress. Um, so, you know, I think I think the non self executing argument really flies in the face of the text and structure of the provision, but it's an off ramp. Um, 
you know, the political question argument is attractive um, to me. So explain to our listeners what political question means. Well, it means a lot of different things. But uh, in, in the sort of in the simplest form, uh, the version of the political question doctrine that we'd be talking about here is the Supreme Court's suggestion that there are some respects, there are some constitutional provisions that commit resolution of disputes to a branch other than the judiciary. Um, and you know, one of my favorite examples of this is uh, the impeachment clauses, um, right? So in a case called, it's the wrong Nixon, it's not Richard Nixon, but in a case called Nixon versus United States in the early 1990s, the Supreme Court held that because the impeachment clauses give the power to impeach to the House and the power to try to the Senate, they contemplate no role for the courts as sort of like appeals from impeachment proceedings. Um, and that therefore, a former federal judge who was challenging the means by which the Senate had conducted his impeachment trial could, you know, federal courts couldn't hear his case. Um, that's like the classic, what's called textually demonstrable commitment um, example of the Supreme Court saying, here's a type of dispute that's committed to somebody else for resolution. Similarly, um, like yeah. the decision on whether to go to war. Yeah, decision whether to go to war. Um, you know, the um, there's a great case from 1849 about which was the duly elected government of Rhode Island. Um, there were two different groups, both claiming to be the democratically elected government of Rhode Island. And there's a case where the Supreme Court says, it's not our job to pick between these two factions. It's Congress's job because Congress chooses which group of representatives and senators to seat. Um, so, you know, there are examples of that. The problem with applying the political question doctrine here is how are the political branches empowered to resolve this dispute, right? So back to what I was saying a few minutes ago, it's easy to understand how the political branches could enforce section three against like a Madison Cawthorn, against someone who's elected, you know, to the House or the Senate. It is not at all obvious how the political branches could enforce Section 3 against a president, right, or a vice president. Um, there are some people who would say that's further proof that Section 3 shouldn't apply to the president. Um, the problem for me is that, you know, I think those arguments are both independently sort of they skew from each other. So the court could say, you know, these were not meant to be resolved by courts. Um, I don't know that that would be convincing analytically, but maybe that's the best way to dodge the, you know, the train wreck that is actually reaching the merits. Um, and isn't that belied by the fact that that there have been cases that have reached the courts on section under section three? Um, yeah, but yeah, but. Yeah, but the U.S. Supreme Court has never specifically said that those cases are just issues. I mean, that that would not bother this court. Um, okay. <laughs> th there are sort of, there are cheaper cop-outs. Um, the court could say that this, that this particular dispute is moot because, you know, once January 5th comes and goes, the Colorado primary ballots are going to be printed um, and Trump's name will be on them. And so, you know, it's too late, the court could say. Um of course, you know, that runs into the obvious problem that this is just going to happen again in the general election cycle. And and so the court, you know, all that would be Asha is kicking the can down the road a couple of months um, and the justices will know that. Um, there's also an exception to mootness doctrine for issues that are, quote, capable of repetition yet evading review. This is a classic example of one of those. So, you know, there are off ramps that the justices could desperately try to cling to. I will just say none of them are especially persuasive um, analytically. And we come back to the same problem, which is if we're just being pure principled lawyers, um, there's one obvious path here. And, you know, are we really going to expect this Supreme Court at this moment in time to do that? So a couple more questions on in terms of what, what you think will happen. Do you think Clarence Thomas will recuse from hearing this? Nope, I don't. So he's going to have to determine whether Trump is disqualified for engaging in an insurrection that his wife helped plot. Yes, I think is the best way to answer that question. Um, I, you know, I think he ought to recuse um, from from this case if it comes to the court. Um, I, I will say, and this is going to get me in more trouble. I, I'm making no fans today, but um, I don't know that 
you are forced to recuse from a case as a judge that's not against your spouse because your spouse, you know, showed support for the activity that the defendants are accused of, right? Um, Thomas did not publicly recuse from the court's order last week in which it expedited its consideration of Jack Smith's cert petition on Trump's immunity. And I think that's a pretty powerful sign that he's not going to recuse from, you know, a Section 3 case either. Um, that's not to say, Asha, that he shouldn't, um, right? If, if you had asked me, do I think he ought to recuse, um, then I think the answer is yes. Um, but, you know, that's different. Okay. And what do you make of the language? And I, I'm saying this because I, I there was a lot made of it last night when people were first parsing the opinion. That was directly quoting Justice Gorsuch, then Judge Gorsuch, in a Colorado case, actually disqualifying a candidate. I mean, how how persuasive is that maybe to him, but also the fact that, at least in principle, this was seemingly okay to do when it was someone other than Trump? I, I think that was a pretty deliberate move by the Colorado Supreme Court. Um, you know, I, I think there are going to be people who believe that using Section 3 to disqualify people from local, state, or federal office is different from using Section 3 to disqualify a presidential candidate. I don't agree with them, but that argument is out there. And it wouldn't shock me if, you know, we find out that Justice Gorsuch is one of the adherents to that argument. Mm. So a little convenient caveat. I mean... Again, there's a reason why I think the Supreme Court was desperately hoping to not have to deal with this case. Yeah, because everything that you're saying to me, Steve, just makes me depressed. And even like, I just feel like the Supreme Court is just going to be left as a completely discredited institution. I mean, it's pretty much almost on the way there right now, but you know. I mean, the, I think the question is, right, what can the court do, assuming this case gets to it, which it seems bound to do, what can the court do to simultaneously not further discredit itself, right, but also um, not hand down a ruling that half the country is going to refuse to, to acknowledge, right? And that's, this is why I think the court didn't want this case in the first place. Um, and, you know, maybe some completely implausible procedural off-ramp is the answer to that. But that, I think, is going to leave a sour taste in lots of people's mouths as well, right? I mean, the, this is the, the problem of having a Supreme Court that is so sharply divided ideologically and where public support is almost perfectly aligned ideologically is that when a case like this comes along, the court is stuck. Um, and, and I just I, I think folks who are sort of waving their hands and saying, of course, the Supreme Court should just affirm the Colorado Supreme Court, or of course, it should just reverse the Colorado Supreme Court, are not thinking holistically about exactly how difficult a position, again, the court has put itself in through its recent behavior. I mean, I, I, this, I'm not trying to take the justices off the hook. They are responsible for the fact that they're now in a bit of a jam, but that doesn't make it any less of a jam. Steve, um, given where the court is, where we ended our last uh, block, I want to talk to you about where it's going in a number of other cases and areas. Just to, you know, end our final episode of 2023 on as depressing a note as possible so we can all, as I like to say, put on sweatpants and eat french fries and eat french fries. Yeah. Um, so let's start first with the other Trump case that sort of was on our radar as of last week, which was Jack Smith's kind of leapfrogging uh, the Court of Appeals to ask for cert before judgment. Um, and I want you to explain what that is and why that's unusual and how unusual it is and whether it's warranted in this case. Sure. I mean, so certiorari before judgment is basically asking the U.S. Supreme Court 
to leapfrog a federal court of appeals. So, you know, most cases in the federal courts um, have three layers of courts. There's the trial courts, which are known as district courts. There's the intermediate appellate courts, which are known as the circuit courts or the courts of appeals, depending upon your persuasion. Um, and then there's the Supreme Court. And the typical case goes through each one of those courts. Um, and most of the cases that come to the U.S. Supreme Court from the federal courts come from a court of appeals. The, the Fifth Circuit is the federal appeals court where I am in Texas. The D.C. Circuit in D.C. gets a lot of you know, high profile cases. Um, cert before judgment is saying, hey, Supreme Court, this case is really important and it's on a really, really ticking clock timeline. You should take it now before the court of appeals even has a chance to rule. And it's an authority the Supreme Court has had since 1925. Um, historically, it was exceptionally rare. I mean, my research assistant and I found 30 examples um, of the Supreme Court granting cert before judgment in the first 94 years that it had the power to do so. So from 1925 to 2019. And Asha, the kinds of cases where the court would grant cert before judgment are you know, like the who's who of high profile, time sensitive. Yeah, I looked at it. It was like our national security law class, basically. Right. It's like, you know, the Nazi saboteurs case during World War II, um, Youngstown steel seizure in the Korean War, uh, the Watergate tapes case, the Iranian hostage crisis, um, the case that tried to bring down the entire bankruptcy court system, the challenge to the federal sentencing guidelines. I mean, like big big structural novel constitutional cases where time was of the essence. This fits in that category. So I think so. I mean, I, you know, you could maybe argue that this is right on the edge of that category, that like the constitutional question is surely important. Um, but the sort of the urgency is kind of political more than it is legal. Um, the problem uh, problem's not the right word. The the what what really sort of kicks it over the over the line is that since 2019, um, the Supreme Court has been far more flexible in granting cert before judgment and has really diluted the criteria. So that in the last four and a half years, the court has granted cert before judgment 19 different times. Um, that's after having gone 15 years with zero of these cases. Um, and as I said, you know, a total of 30 over 94 years. So they've gone from one every three or three to five years to like five a year. And I saw your chart. It looked like a lot of those cases, for example, were the COVID religious liberty cases. So COVID religious liberty cases, um, the student loan program, which was a big deal, but it wasn't like a constitutional crisis. Right. Um, it wasn't even a constitutional case. Um, you know, my, my, the, the most troubling example, right, is a, a death penalty case where the only reason why the court granted cert before judgment was because if they had waited for the Fourth Circuit, they would have had to wait until President Biden came to office. And he probably would have commuted this federal prisoner's death sentence. So, you know, the court actually, once again, this is a, a theme consistent with the A block, um, bears some responsibility for the fact that what used to be this rare, extraordinary authority that maybe would not have been a great fit, maybe it would have, I think you could argue both ways, for the Jack Smith appeal, like has been used for cases that are so obviously less important than this one, that now I think the court, you know, the, the only way I could see the court denying cert before judgment, and, and they might have ruled on this by the time this comes out, um, is because the DC circuit has already said that it's going to move really, really fast. Yes. Um, so the D.C. Circuit has issued a briefing schedule. The D.C. Circuit has scheduled oral argument for January 9th. Um, and so I could see the U.S. Supreme Court maybe right denying cert before judgment only because they know the D.C. Circuit's going to move very, very, very quickly. And so just so I understand procedurally how that worked, did Trump appeal to the to the circuit court and then they set the expedited and then jack smith was trying to leapfrog directly to the supreme court so that's kind of why it's sort of in both places that's right and and i mean procedurally it had to happen that way so cert before judgment still requires the case to be in a court of appeals um and so jack smith couldn't go to the u.s supreme court until trump appealed judge chutkin's decision um i, I think from jack smith's perspective you know, going on both tracks is fine as long as someone's moving quickly. Um, and so, you know, it's possible that if nothing else, asking the Supreme Court for cert before judgment helped put pressure 
on the DC circuit to set such an expedited schedule. Um, so that either way, you know, I, I think, I mean, his goal, I presume, is to have this issue resolved in advance of what is at least for now the March 4th trial date, right? Um, I, you know, whether the Supreme Court goes immediately or whether it waits for the DC circuit and then moves very quickly, I think that's still possible. Uh, really? Which is why, yeah, I mean, the, you know, in these cases, historically, the Supreme Court has moved very, very fast. I mean, folks might not remember, but with the Texas SB8 abortion cases in October 2021, the court held oral argument 10 days after it granted cert before judgment um, in those cases and issued a ruling like five weeks later. Um, like the court is able to move exceptionally quickly when it feels impelled to do so. I think the question is just, you know, are the justices going to feel the need to move quickly here? And in that respect, I mean, Asha, I think, you know, the Section 3 case probably just puts that much more, you know, the, the court's like, fine, we're going to have to deal with all of this. Let's just go. Yeah. And it looks like Jack Smith has asked for the same schedule in terms of timing that was used in, in Nixon. Yep. And so, so, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, I think let, 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 let's work backwards. I think the odds that the Supreme court answers the immunity question by the end of February are actually pretty high. Um, whether that, whether the, the, pro, the process that gets us there is cert before judgment, January argument, February decision, or, Denial cert before judgment, DC Circuit goes, Supreme Court reviews that decision very quickly. I don't know. I mean, that that remains to be seen. But I think I think either way, the odds that this issue gets resolved one way or the other by, you know, the spring um, are high. Um, and and I, I will say I am more confident that the court will sort of rule what I think is the correct way on the law, which is to say no immunity um, mm -hmm. in that case than I am in the Section 3 case. Okay, well, that's that's relieving. And in some ways, just to tie this to the earlier block, I feel like in some ways the January 6th case is starting to become the most important one in a way. Like, you know, as if the if the Supreme Court were to say something like, you know, you would need a conviction for an insurrection related offense or something, the January 6th case could arguably fall into that category. I mean, this goes back to Jack Smith's decision, which I think is a very significant one to not indict Trump for insurrection itself. Yeah. Um, and that that's, you know, that's relevant here in at least two respects. One, it means that there's no direct overlap between the two cases, between the Section 3 case and the, the criminal case in D.C. But two, you know, the insurrection statute is one of the handful of criminal statutes that include disqualification as a consequence. Yeah, I always thought of the insurrection rebellion statute as effectively operationalizing Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, yep. right? Yep. Because it basically said it takes the same conduct that the 14th Amendment contemplates, makes it criminal, and then imposes that pen that uh, prohibition on holding public office as an explicit penalty. And to tie all the threads together, I mean, if you really wanted to lean all the way into the non-self-execution argument about Section 3, you could point to the Insurrection Act, and, or sorry, not the, the Insurrection Statute, different one, um, yes. <laughs> and say, you know, here's Congress executing it. Yes. And, and it was Jack Smith's choice not to indict Trump under 2383. So... What about the other cases on the horizon? What are we what are we looking at? How <laughs> how bad is it? I mean, it's remarkable how the sort of the thematic core of the Supreme Court's term has been completely hijacked in the last two weeks. Um, this was a term that was going to be about a lot of other things. And now it's basically the term of Trump. Um, you know, I, I, the, the, the court took up these big Mipha Pristone cases um, last week, I think, um, the story there is a story that we're going to see in a lot of cases this term, which is less about how conservative the Supreme Court is than about how much less conservative it is than the Fifth Circuit. Um, there are a number of cases the court's going to decide this term where I think we're going to get narrow, moderate, you know, procedurally heavy decisions that scale back more aggressive, right-leaning rulings from the Federal Court of Appeals in New Orleans. 
Um, Mifepristone, I think, is going to be one of them. My best guess is that the court will say the plaintiffs don't have standing. Um, and so access to Mifepristone remains safe. And so, and just to be uh, clear on what that case is, this is about access to abortion via the abortion pill. Yes. And, you know, as I mean, as you know, right back in April, um, a federal judge in Amarillo issued a ruling that had it gone into effect would have really complicated, if not heavily circumscribed, access to mifepristone everywhere in the country and not just in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, the Supreme Court already put that ruling on hold in April, which is part of why I'm more confident than usual about how this is going to play out on the merits. But, you know, I think this is going to be before the Trump cases came along. I had thought that the theme of this term was going to be the Supreme Court pushing back against the Fifth Circuit. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Not just Mifepristone. There's the Rahimi case about whether the Second Amendment protects the right of individuals who are subject to domestic violence related mm -hmm. restraining orders to have firearms. I think the court's going to reverse the Fifth Circuit there. Um, there's a social media case. There are two social media cases, right? There's the jawboning case yeah. where mm -hmm. a couple of states and some private plaintiffs have sued the Biden administration, claiming that they coerced social media companies into taking down posts with COVID vaccine related mis and disinformation. Um, again, that case followed the same procedural pattern as the Mifepristone case, broad injunction from a district court, um, not really frozen by the Fifth Circuit, frozen by the Supreme Court. Now, is this all coming from the same judge? Like, is it that lone judge in... So there are a handful. I mean, so Matthew Kaczmarek and Amarillo is one of them. Um, but there, you know, the, the jawboning cases from Judge Terry Dowdy um, in Louisiana. Um, you know, there are a couple of other judges in Texas who have their names on some of the more extreme rulings. I, I think, I mean, I wrote about this for... Um, for the Atlantic last month. Like I think part of what's happening is you have the you have litigants who are now seeking out the most conservative judges they can find, which in Texas you can do. Like you can almost hand pick your judge if you file in the right forum. Um and you have the Fifth Circuit. Don't you need some kind of con I mean I don't understand how all of the what's the connection? In many of these cases, there isn't one, but you know the federal government is subject to what the lawyers call nationwide service of process, um, which means in practical terms, it's pretty easy to challenge federal policies anywhere. Um, and even mm -hmm. in the in the um, Mifepristone case, I mean, they basically sort of created this shell uh, uh, company um, mm -hmm. and had it and and mm -hmm. you know rented an office in Amarillo. Right for the sole purpose of basically being able to bring the lawsuit there. So you know, as it's not just that that's happening, Asha, it's that you also have a court of appeals, the Fifth Circuit, that is not reining in these district judges, um, and that leads it to the Supreme Court to rein in the Fifth Circuit. So I think that you know, insofar as we can separate the story of Trump from what else is happening in the Supreme Court this term, the larger part, the or at least the second part of that, is really a struggle between what we might call the middle justices, um, right? Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Kavanaugh, Justice Barrett, the sort of the middle three. And I know I, that, the, that they're the middle, right? I, not median, just middle, um, right? Not moderate, just, you know, um, but like the, the, the sort of the war between them and the Fifth Circuit, I think is actually a real theme of the term. And I think that the, the Fifth Circuit is going to lose more of those than it wins. And is that partly their fault too? Like, did they embolden mm -hmm. these the Fifth Circuit and these judges sure. in the past? I mean, it's like they it's like they've created Frankenstein. I feel like they've done this all around. So, in a couple of ways, I mean, I think the court has you know last term, I think it had a chance to really push back aggressively against the ability of states to be the lead plaintiffs in lawsuits against the federal government, and in two cases they did um, right in the Indian Child Welfare Act case and in the immigration enforcement priorities case, they actually held that Texas didn't have standing. But then they got to the student loan case and came up with a completely contrived reason why Missouri had standing, which just enables and empowers the Fifth Circuit. Um, the other thing I'll say is, you know, in the past, when a particular lower court has had such a bad track record, the justices have not been shy about calling them out, whether it was the Ninth Circuit um, back in the days in which it was much more progressive than it is today, or the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, or the Sixth Circuit, which about 10 years ago got in a lot of trouble for being overly sort of deferential to prisoners in certain types of cases. Um, 
And at least thus far, Asha, the Supreme Court has said nary a word about the Fifth Circuit, even though last term, the Fifth Circuit had the worst overall batting average of any court of appeals in the Supreme Court. Um, mm-hmm. And it's on its way to actually be even worse this term. I mean, the court has taken 55 cases so far this term. 11 of them are from the Fifth Circuit. That's wow. insane. That is insane. And, 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 it's, and you know, there, are, you could, there have been years um, where, you know, you've had anomalous numbers like that because it was just the court took a bunch of cases from, say, the Second Circuit that were not ideologically charged. Of the 11 cases the court is hearing from the Fifth Circuit, 10 of them have pretty strong ideological, you know, sort of uh, valence. Um, and just that, and are purposefully you know, if, being brought in as your book details, like kind of uh, yes, are, I, are created to raise the issues, I guess. I wouldn't say all 10. I mean, right. So U.S. versus Rahimi is a federal criminal prosecution. I don't yeah. think right. The, 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 the federal government prosecuted Rahimi where he was. Fair enough. But, yeah, yeah. But, but seven or eight of the 10 or 11 are in the Fifth Circuit on purpose. That's absolutely right. Yeah. For those of you who have not yet read it, you should definitely pick up a copy of The Shadow Docket. Uh, it's fantastic. It will give you an understanding of the procedural machinations of the court. Um, I had Steve on for my Substack to talk about it, and uh, it was incredibly illuminating and... Sadly, I had to go out and buy a lot of sweatpants after. It is it is a sweatpant and french fry inducing book. Yes, but read it. So, Steve, before we go, uh, the holidays are upon us. And uh, I assume that you, ha- you celebrate Hanukkah. That's what they tell me. And I, I'm curious, I just have to ask, because I have a lot of Jewish friends, half of them don't celebrate Christmas, but like, half of them do. Um, yeah, that's, that's weird. Yeah, I know. But some people can't just, they can't resist the tree. Um, so I'm just curious, what's, what happens during the holidays in your household? I mean, I, I suspect this is going to sound somewhat familiar. Um, but so, you know, part of it depends on whether Hanukkah overlaps with Christmas or not, because um, being the 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 contrarians that we are right we're on the lunar calendar um and so you know this year hanukkah was actually much earlier hanukkah was like the first and second week of december next year it actually in 2024 perfectly aligns with christmas for once so that'll be nice um of course you know the during i mean we basically made up hanukkah as a holiday just to compete with christmas um it's not an especially religious holiday in judaism you don't really go to temple like it's just a we didn't want our kids to feel left out. It, it, it's a guilt. It's the holiday of, of, of preemptively of commercial guilt. guilt. That's right. So, um, so we do like, we do theme nights in my family. So like there's a book night, there's like art night, there's like doll night, I don't know, whatever. Um, and then when it comes time for Christmas, assuming Hanukkah did not overlap, um, we eat Chinese food and go to the movies. Oh, fun. And I love that the movie theater is always open on Christmas day. Um, yep. So does that mean that, do, do all these theme nights mean that those are themes for gifts? Like, do you get gifts yes. every night? So uh, different families do it differently. Um, you know, we spoil my children. And so the girls get, you know, presents every night. Um, that was not true for me growing up. I just want to say thanks, mom and dad. Um, but, you know, we are, we've lost the culture war. So we are, we, we have one theme for every night. Now, some of the gifts are small. I mean, like, so, uh, you know, book night might be one book, but. Um, we have to compete and, and Christmas is a tough holiday to compete with. Yes. And there's how many nights? Not eight, eight, eight nights. Wow. Okay. That seems fun though. Uh, sure. Uh, I will say that I, one of the things that really struck me, I've, I've lived in Texas now for seven and a half years and I grew up in New York and, you know, spent most of my life in the sort of the Northeast corridor. Um, it is remarkable sort of. When you live in New York or D.C. or places like that, I think there's less of the assumption that you celebrate Christmas. Um, when you live in Texas, everyone assumes you celebrate Christmas. And yeah. it's like, actually, we, we celebrate Hanukkah. Yay. Yeah. So, you know, my family's Hindu. Um, and also, we're on the lunar calendar. Um, and so the closest 
holiday I think Hindus have is Diwali, but that's usually like sometime right. in November. Right. Um, which is also many days. I forget how many, to be honest. I mean, Diwali is a real holiday. Diwali is a real holiday. I know, but it it just doesn't get the love. Um, I think, and it's it's not quite close enough. So, plus Diwali being the festival of lights, and Hindus love lights. If you've been to any Indian restaurant, you know there's always Christmas lights up. So, um, I I think we just can't resist the Christmas tree. And my parents, when we when they first came to the United States. Um, I think, you know, just as a, to assimilate and same thing, like my, my sister and I, our, all our friends, we grew up in Virginia. So everybody was getting presents. Everybody had the Christmas tree. So I, I grew up, um, doing that. Um, but yeah, it's a completely, it's just a commercial gift giving frenzy. Like, you know, there's no religious component to it really. I have to confess. And now my now I'm part of the problem. My my children are, you know, beneficiaries of this as well. But I mean we just you know, we try you know, I mean we take in you know in Judaism we we take the high holidays very seriously, right? So Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Mm-hmm. Um and you know, and I think our our what we tell the girls is, you know, there the there are lots of holidays in Judaism in sort of descending order of religious importance. Um and Hanukkah is pretty far down the scale, but you know sometimes holidays are culturally important even when they're not religiously important. Yeah, yeah, I would say it's it's similar, and I I've always been struck that there's a lot of similarities between Hindu culture and Jewish culture. Mm-hmm. I've heard it called the Om Shalom uh, connection, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's fun to hear how how different people celebrate. And um, is it over now? Because wasn't oh yeah. It's over. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's over. It is. Okay, we 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 survived Hanukkah. Okay, so you're just you're waiting now for the Chinese takeout and movie. What's the movie on the agenda? Uh, I think we're taking the girls to see Migration, which is the new Illumination movie. Okay, I've never heard of this movie. Uh, not what I would have chosen, but you uh, okay. know, this this will this will spare me from seeing Napoleon. So I guess it's I guess it works out for everybody. <laughs> Awesome. Well, happy holidays, Steve. And thank you for joining and for giving us this uh, very insightful um, commentary on what to expect. And let's just hope for the best in 2024. Um, it's, it, we we got to hope for the best because everything else is too depressing. Yes. Thanks, Asha. Take care. Hey everybody, I wish I could have been there this week, but I'm here in St. Lucia with my wife having a great time and relaxing after a really tough year. So have a happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, and every other holiday to all of you who celebrate.